Well, well uh, it's great to be back in New Hampshire. Uh, clearly, we've uh, the world's changed in the last week. Uh, we uh, are standing strong on behalf of the state of Israel in what's one of their, their darkest moments and one of their greatest challenges. I think it's important that the president show leadership, uh, not just uh, by backing their right to defend themselves, but understanding that this is something that is going to perhaps take some time. Uh, you may start to see the, the fortunes in terms of the, the, the media or internationally start to uh, blame Israel for it, and we just have to stand with them through thick and thin. They need to finish this problem once and for all. And the barbarity of it was just uh, unbelievable. I mean, I, I served in Iraq back in the day on active duty when Al Qaeda in Iraq was running wild. And there were some things that were really significant atrocities. And I know ISIS and other things we've seen through the years. But to behead babies, uh, what they were doing to the women and elderly was uh, the bottom of the barrel in terms of the depravity of human nature. Uh, the president needs to understand that Iran is ultimately uh, the, the funder of this type of terrorism. Uh, he should take back that $6 billion uh, that they had uh, prepared to give, and he should also uh, tighten the screws financially with the oil revenue, use all the tools at the disposal, because the money that goes into that regime, they're not using it to create a better life for the people of Iran. They're using it uh, to fund terrorism, and we know that, and we have known that, and he should not be under the delusion you're going to have a reproachment with Iran. I also think, given the, the situation there, now's not the time to be doing like what Donald Trump did by attacking Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, uh, attacking Israel's defense minister, uh, saying somehow that Hezbollah were, were very smart. Uh, we need to all be on the same page. Uh, now's not the time to air personal grievances about an Israeli prime minister. Now's the time uh, to support their right to defend themselves to the hilt. I think this uh, 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 situation in Israel should make our domestic situation all the more urgent with the open border that we've been living through and I've been talking about for a long time. As governor of Florida, I've taken action in a variety of ways. As a candidate, I've put out the boldest plan to deal with it. If you don't think that our enemies uh, are going to exploit or have, have exploited that border, then I don't know what to tell you. We know people have come from China, from Russia from Iran, from other parts of the Middle East, to come across illegally into our country. And so it's been a great vulnerability. Uh, the President needs to reverse course on his policy. This will be a day one issue that we're able to take care of uh, as President. And uh, I've said Republicans have been talking about this for so long. Uh, they talked about building the wall, having Mexico pay, all this stuff. Uh, and even before that, and it's just never gotten done. And so now's the time to, to bring it to a conclusion. And that's exactly what we'll do. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Local? Any of you guys local here? Sure. Yep. Yeah. Uh, do you agree with um, others, including Nikki Haley, who say now is the time to end Hamas or finish Hamas? I think that they need to not just have a reprisal, but they need to uproot and eliminate the entire Hamas network and Hamas members because what's happened over the years is they've, they've struck back and then you end up with another round of attacks and it's kind of just seesaws back and forth and when you have babies being decapitated uh, you can't just say we're gonna have what's the proportionate response to that you can't have a country if that is allowed to happen to your citizens so I think they need to do everything they need to do so that Hamas is no more it would be helpful for them if the administration understood the financing with Iran and took steps to, to prevent that because ultimately Hamas and Hezbollah, they're pro Iranian proxies. Uh, yes, Hamas, no question. It's not like Iran is telling them to hate Israel. They do hate Israel, there's no question, but they wouldn't have the wherewithal to be able to conduct an attack of that nature. I also think it's important to point out because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Israel does not occupy the Gaza Strip. Israel pulled out of Gaza in 2005 and the people in the Gaza Strip turned to Hamas for, for the leadership. They elected Hamas and instead of trying to make life better, and it's actually a, a nice coastline there, they've um, really pursued the Hamas agenda of hating Israel, fomenting terrorism, and the results of course you know, have been disastrous for the people of Gaza, but ultimately 
uh, those folks who are supporting Hamas, they don't want a two-state solution. They want the elimination of the Jewish state. That that is their goal, and that is just something that you can't you, know, you, you can't just work with that. If they don't believe you have a right to exist, how could you you know have a negotiation? Do you think this attack that happened a week ago increases the likelihood they're going to be attempted terrorist attacks here in this country? And what should this administration be doing to prevent that from happening? Well, I would say I don't have any specific intelligence on this, so I'm not speaking as any, like I've received this as governor, but because um, I haven't received any reports yet. But uh, does it marginally increase? Of course it would marginally increase. I, I think you now have passions inflamed around the world. We know that there's a lot of people that have come into this country who are not accounted for, that we have no idea who they are, haven't been vetted. And we also know, and, and look, it's it's very, very sad to see some of the demonstrations that were happening around this country praising Hamas after all the the news of the barbarity and they're out there with pro Hamas demonstrations to see schools like Harvard have all these students signing these declarations in support uh, of Hamas you know that's a real real sickness uh, in this society and I think we've got a Start taking a look. Okay, you know what are we supposed to do? Yeah, you can have different views. Of course you can. Uh, but what would prompt somebody to go out and support an organization that was beheading infants, that was raping women, that was assassinating elderly people? Uh, that that's not that's not good. So we've got a, a a lot of issues here, and I absolutely think that that this is something. And I said even before this happened. I said the open border, we will be able to tie a terrorist attack in the future to the border. As much as I hope that's not the case, it's just you, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a math issue when you have that many millions of people. I mean, even if like 0.1% are bad, I mean, that's a whole lot of people at that point. Governor, do you think any of these major world events can change the dynamic of this Republican primary? I don't know, but what I think that it shows is we've got a lot of issues that this country has to deal with at home with the rising prices that people have been suffering under, economic stagnation, open border, crime in our cities, problems with education, and, and now we have problems abroad. And we knew some of these, of course. Uh, we, we, we know China represents our top global threat. You see the situation in Europe. Uh, I was always one to say terrorism is not a thing of the past. It's something that we, and I, I would talk about Iran, but now the Middle East, uh, from, we were in a direction where you potentially could have had a Saudi-Israeli peace agreement, which would have potentially been very good for the region in terms of the security. Now that seems a little bit more elusive. So I think what it does, and then you see the chaos in Washington, D.C. with the speaker's race. They can't even elect somebody. They can't even function uh, as a legislative body. I think what it calls for is it calls for leadership that's disciplined, leadership that's focused, a president that's going to be focusing on your issues, uh, not on other distractions, a president that's up to the job. you got to take that 2 a.m. phone call. You don't sleep through the night like this president did. Uh, you got to be out there. You got to be leading. But we need to. We need a, a president that's going to focus on the people's issues. That's going to be sober. That's going to be able to respond positively in a crisis, and it's going to be able to deliver the results that the people of this country deserve, both both here and abroad. And, and I'm the guy that's been able. You know, we've handled probably more crises as a governor than any governor has had to handle, from COVID to hurricanes to. We had a, a condo collapse, these different things, how we handled the BLM riots, not allowing that to overrun Florida. Uh, we've showed our mettle when, um, when, when it's called for, and I think we do the same as president. A, a little bit earlier today, uh, North Dakota Governor Burgum filed, and he said, essentially explaining his, his uh, status in the polls, that you know, people like, when they know about me, they like me. Um, you know, you're a well-known candidate. Polling indicates that you've lost popularity in New Hampshire. What are you going to do to turn that around? Yeah, I don't think that that's necessarily true. I think if you look at the favorability that I've had, I'm one of the most uh, well-liked Republicans in the country. Now, it's different than a ballot test to how you do that. That's how people are ultimately going to vote, which does matter, but that matters as you get closer. So I've been attacked more than any all the other candidates combined. If you look at the amount of money that's been spent against me, clearly I get, uh, I get attacks from the left, from the media. And, and yet, people still 
understand I'm a good leader, a good governor, all that stuff. So um, we're going to translate that into vote share uh, as we get closer. But I don't think people have been paying close attention in terms of making up their mind. The majority of voters in both Iowa and New Hampshire have not made up their mind about who they're going to vote for. I think you see that in some of the president's numbers. He's got, you know, some of his support is, is definitely solid. A lot of that is they're considering Trump but other candidates. And then you have a huge segment of both Iowa and New Hampshire who would not are not going to vote for Trump under any circumstances. So that's kind of the playing field that we thought going into this that would happen. That's really still the case. The, the ballot lines, they can go up and down six months before, uh, 100 days out. But as we get into this, that's when you're going to start to see support consolidate. And the thing is, is um, you know, you look at, okay, there's however many people are going to be for Trump. Let's say in New Hampshire, that's 20 no matter what happens, right? And then probably 35% aren't going to vote for him in New Hampshire no matter what. And then the others are considering Trump or others. And so if you, if you want to change from Trump, I think I'm the best leader and I give you the best chance to be able uh, to do well. If you're still considering Trump, what do I offer that's better? Well, a couple things. One, I can serve two terms. Uh, he'd be a lame duck on day one. Even if he could get elected, he'd be a lame duck. I don't know how, as a lame duck president, with all the stuff he's dealing with, you can go in and actually get the job done that we need to get done. I will come in laser focused. Uh, I'm in my prime. I, I don't need the teleprompter. I don't need any of that. Uh, we go and we get the job done. Very important. Also, deliverables. I've delivered more for Republicans, conservative ideas, America first principles than anybody running. Everything I promised I'd do in Florida, I did. We got it done. But we did it in a way where we built this massive coalition to win 60-40 in a state that had always been evenly divided. Uh, that's what you need to be doing, and I think the, the former president as the nominee uh, would end up, the whole election would be about, about him and this and that, and it wouldn't be about the issues that people are concerned about, and that would give the Democrats a huge advantage in the general election, and I don't think that that's something uh, that we want to want to do. Um, and then also just, uh, we do need to pass the torch here. I mean, I, I look in Washington, you see all these people that are serving in their late 70s, 80s. It's like, I, I think we should have term limits for members of Congress. Uh, I think that we should uh, be in a situation where people aren't hanging on and clinging to power so long. And we see what's happened with Biden from where he was four or five years ago to where he is now. And uh, we, need, uh, we need an energetic executive, and I would provide that. Are you going to focus on Iowa? We're going to do both. Uh, I think you got. To, we're all in on all the early states. I think just structurally, the way we've done up to now is, I'm doing the full Grassley in Iowa. It's very important. It's it's akin to like you know people in New Hampshire. You do the the town halls. You do. There's certain things that matter, and if you're not doing those, and I think going to all 99 counties there is a tradition that sets you apart. I'm the only candidate that's doing that, and that's going to benefit me. So we've knocked out the the vast majority of that. I don't want to finish it now because I want that 99th county to be a big splash as we get closer to caucus. Uh, but we knew we were going to put a lot of emphasis on that. And then September I had to deal with the hurricane and some other things, so I wasn't able to get to New Hampshire. We had to debate in the West. You know, we should be doing these Republican debates in New Hampshire and in Iowa since we're going to be there anyways. I mean, I love the Ronald Reagan. I love the library. But to go all the way out there, we were out there for a week, which is fine. You know, we did our thing. But um, I hope the other debates will be, will be closer to where the action is. Um, but now we're in a situation, uh, we've gone to a lot of rural counties, we've gone places no one's gone before, we've been able to amass a lot of support in terms of commit to caucuses. People that have worked for the winners of the past three contested caucuses, they all tell me universally, you are so far ahead of where we were at this, at this point in time. So I think the work's paid off. You go to like a rural county, it's not something that's necessarily going to show up in like a poll, certainly like a national poll that's not going to show up at all. It's not something, but you're building the groundwork uh, and you're getting the people in place to then turn them out in, in a, probably a snowy mid-January uh, mid day. And so now that we've done a lot of that, I'm still going to be in Iowa a lot, but we're going to be in New Hampshire a lot and we are going to be you know, doing the town halls, we're going to be doing the house, we're going to do everything that you need to do to be able to win uh, in New Hampshire. And I think the good thing about New Hampshire, I mean, I think that, I think New Hampshire is like so wide open. I know they'll take a full say, oh, Trump, I, I think people have not made up their mind at all in this race. Uh, I think that there's uh, a lot of ground uh, to be able to trod here. And I think more and more people are gonna start keying in 
And when they do that, I think we're going to be able to pre present ourselves as the top candidate. Governor, for President Trump, what is your message to New Hampshire voters who might be weighing you against someone like Nikki Haley, who's a former governor, was a former UN ambassador? Why should they vote for you? Well, I'm the only one that's actually worn this country's uniform in the presidential race. Uh, I served and volunteered. In fact, I mean, I was uh, I commissioned in New England. I was in. Uh, in Harvard Law School, this is after 9/11, and I volunteered. I'm probably the the only person, uh, one of the few, uh, who had degrees from Yale and Harvard and volunteered to serve in the military during during wartime. And we volunteered to serve in Iraq. I served in Yemen. I served some other places. So I had an exposure to Middle East. I had an exposure to terrorism that was different than what any of these other folks have had. I also was uh, on House Foreign Affairs for six years. I was the National Security Subcommittee Chairman as a U.S. Congressman. We were intimately involved in issues relating to, to Israel, to the broader Middle East, of course the Western Hemisphere, and then as Governor, uh, we have done missions across the, the world. I've done Israel, Japan, we've done uh, South Korea, we've done London, and so we have really, really strong uh, bona fides when it comes to that, uh, you know, look, the, I think the UN is a worthless organization, quite frankly. So that's to me is not uh, something all they do is sanction Israel. Like that's really what it exists for. Okay, how has it really moved the needle in any positive way? I think it's, I think that the, their behavior has been, been a complete disgrace. But you also have the issue of, okay, who's fluent in this stuff? Who knows kind of uh, where they're trying to go with, with America's role? And quite frankly, most of those other Republican candidates, they're just rehashing the failed foreign policy of the last 25 years, where we ended up in Afghanistan for 20 years. Uh, I served in a, in a quagmire in Iraq. Um, I don't think that they've updated their thinking so that we could have a more peace through strength foreign policy, uh, but we're not getting dragged into indeterminate conflicts that don't end up with clear conception of victory. Uh, I, and we're going to actually be doing a good foreign policy speech coming up here in the next couple weeks, and we'll let you know in advance of that. But I think our vision is really more consistent with um, uh, with a Reagan type foreign policy rather than the more modern neoconservative kind of uh, hyper intervention policy, uh, but but you have so you have that, and I think that approach is important. Then you have leadership and judgment. Who's actually been in the fire, and actually had to make big tough decisions and delivered when it counts? They have not had to do that. In fact, you know, a lot of times when they get when they get heat, you know, they, they bend the knee. We stand up and we, we deliver, and that ultimately is what it requires to be a leader. If it's all, we, if it's all it is is just taking a poll and doing what the poll says, you know, that, that, that anyone can do that. No, there's times where you've got to make difficult decisions on behalf of the people that may put you in political peril, that may make it so that uh, you get some blowback. But a good leader is going to see that through, and that's what I've demonstrated to do particularly taking on elites and conventional wisdom. And we did that during COVID, and you know, now people look back, nobody makes a credible argument that we were wrong about businesses, about schools being open, opposing the, the COVID shot mandates, none of that stuff. I mean, we got those right, but we went into the teeth of elite opinion, of the bureaucracy, of, of a lot of corporate media, and, and took a lot of incoming as a result of that. But that's really what it's all about. I mean, do you have the metal uh, to be a strong leader? And, and that's what we've shown, and I don't think anyone else has been able to deliver like we have. Governor, Governor last question. President Trump was, Final question. Former President Trump was critical of Prime Minister Netanyahu yesterday. What do you make of those comments? And having yourself been to Israel and met with Netanyahu, what do you make of his leadership, uh, especially in this moment of crisis? Now is not the time to be attacking our ally. Prime Minister Netanyahu is somebody that I've become friends with. Um, he is managing one of the most difficult situations Israel's ha ever had to face. Uh, you may have a personal vendetta or beef with him, but is that really the time to be out there doing that and to be attacking the Israeli defense minister? I don't think so. So uh, we're standing behind uh, Israel. We want them to be able to defend themselves, and we want them to be successful in this conflict. Uh, but you're not going to find me uh, throwing verbal grenades uh, at the Israeli leadership. Uh, you know, it's easy to it's easy to kind of do that. You can always second guess people, but that's not what we need now. What we need is to come together, and we need to win a victory. Uh, uh, we need.
Israel to win the victory, and, and we will be supporting their right to do so. Okay, thanks, everybody. Thank you.